Hello and welcome to Bud's RPG Review, where I give my thoughts on role-playing games, card games and board games. Today's retro review is Genatella, Crucible of the Hero Wars, for RuneQuest 3rd Edition by Chaosium. Ok, first a bit of history. Released in 1988, Genatella, Crucible of the Hero Wars is a box set dedicated to the continent of Genatella, where prophecies have decreed that the Hero Wars will take place. It contains a map of the region, and three books. Book 1, the 38-page Garantha book, Book 2, the 98-page Ganatella book, and Book 3, the 34-page Player's book. It was the 8th box set released for this edition. Also, I need to thank my friend Mark for letting me borrow his copy for this review. OK, to the cover. Here, we have a fairly decent piece by Sam and Max creator Steve Purcell. First up is Galantha Book 1. We have an introduction on how to use this supplement. It explains the extent of what the average player would know about Galantha, with that being generally regional knowledge. Following this, we have a map of the world of Galantha, showing the main areas. It then goes into an editor's introduction, gives us some basic facts about Garantha and its magical nature. It talks about how humans are a relatively new race, with a technological level roughly equivalent to Earth's Bronze Age. It explains that Garantha is populated by gods, demigods and chaos entities. Indeed, the sun itself is the god Yelm. The non-human races are known as the Elder Races, dwarfs, elves, trolls and dragon newts. It then goes on to describe the physical nature of Garantha. Climate and geology wise, it's very similar to Earth with everything ranging from mountains to swamps present. Geological activity is significant here with sudden magical shifts able to sink entire continents on occasion. Discusses the different levels of civilization with there being four human racial types. The dark skinned Agamori, yellow skinned Kalori, blue skinned Veldang and white skinned Weren. Other minor races exist but these make up the majority. It then goes on to talk about the economics of the world and the importance of magic and religion. Discusses how, due to the ease of how magic can heal wounds, violence is often used to settle disputes. Indeed, disease is far more dangerous on Glorantha. It talks about how dangerous existence is on Glorantha, and how the many deities have vast influence on the population. Glorantha generally suffers from cataclysmic disasters every few centuries, usually via invasion of monsters or unknown races, destruction of continents or dire plagues. These are said to be precursors to the prophesied hero wars. More on that later. Living to old age on Glorantha is usually a sign of obtaining great power. It gives discussion on Glorantan society and the politics involved at the various levels of civilization, and then goes on to talk about the role that adventurers play in shaping the future of Glorantha. Following that we have the six worlds of Glorantha. First up it discusses the God Plain. This is a metaphysical region of myth and legend where the gods reside. Both heaven and hell are here, and every deed that was performed by a god and goddess is replayed. These can be reached by powerful religious ceremonies or hero questing. Heroes can take part in great events from history here, although it cannot be reached in a physical body. After this we have the spirit plane. This is a place that has no physical reality, that hovers invisibly around the inner world and it's a featureless grey fog. It's a place where the bodiless spirits live and lost souls wander. We then have the hero plane. This overlaps the lower world, the upper world and the outer world. Places not reachable by mortals. Heroes can visit there to gain great treasures and allies and can be reached by the boats of the Doradi shamans. It's a place for heroes and is generally deadly to those not prepared. The outer world is a place of extremes that lie outside the realm of mankind and are the far reaches of Glorantha, like the Sea of Fire or Sramak River which encircles the inner world. The upper world is the realm of the Sky People, where wondrous creatures live, like the Bird of Gifts and the Thunderman. It's a place of joy and wonder. The lower plane is known as the Underworld and is populated by maleficent denizens that plot the downfall of the creatures of light and life. It can be reached by some places on Glorantha like the Hellcrack and Magaster's Pool. Finally, we have the inner world, which is the realm inhabited by mortals. Next up, we have the world history of Glorantha. Here it gives us a literary interpretation from prehistory, and this is followed by the mythic origins as interpreted by the god learners. More on them later. It describes the balanced forces of the grower and the maker, and how Glorantha the life force emerged from them. It explains how Glorantha bore children, the powers and the elements, represented by the runes, that became incarnated and were the celestial court. It takes us through the age of Umath, the death of Yelm and the great darkness which ushered chaos into the world. It gives brief explanation of the great compromise that saved the world and the goddess Arachne Solara spreading her web across the world and creating time. After this we have the Dawn Age. This covers the time after the great compromise and how the race has spread and expanded. It talks about the events of Dawn Age Seshnella, the golden empire of Osantalka and the birth of Nysalor. It gives details of the Gabaji War and the Crusade of Arkat which led to the destruction of Gabaji and Arkat discovering hero questing. It then talks about the Imperial Age, which discusses the formation of the Empire of the Worms Friends and their rule in Dragon Pass right through to the Dragon Kill Wars of 1120. Next up, it discusses the God Learners. I feel I should say at this point that if you've seen any of my other RuneQuest reviews on my channel, you'll have seen the God Learners mentioned many times. 
This is the first proper explanation of who they were and what they were capable of doing that I've come across, and it's truly fascinating. The best way of describing the God Learners is that they were quasi-religious philosopher, sorcerer, mathematician, scientists. A bit of a mouthful maybe, but all will become clear. The philosophy was one of the interpretation and unification of the various mythologies of Garantha. The earliest practitioners were the Seven Explorers, a collection of wizards and priests from Radinthanos of Jurastella. Although their secrets died with them, it is evident that they had a power called RuneQuest Sight. This enabled them to see the inherent patterns and relationships of the world and allowed them to organise them according to the runes. When hero questing, they would follow the paths of the runes through the spirit world and then shape it by planting those runes elsewhere. This gave them a unified theory of mythology that allowed them to grasp some of the greater mysteries of the world. Indeed, by doing this, they united the origins of Orlanth, Yelm, Krolorla, Kaigalitor, the Invisible God, Megasta, and the Earths. Unfortunately, the god learners used shortcuts. This allowed them power which they never truly understood. At first, this had no effect. They famously took part in the god switch of 849, in which two earth spirits were swapped as objects of worship with no noticeable effect. Also, nobody noticed in Krolorla when they replaced the ancient empire with their own version of draconic powers by adopting the path of imminent mastery. They were the ones who organised all the grant of magic into the three dominant systems of divine, spirit and sorcery. Indeed, Grandfather Mortal is a construct of the god learners as they combine the primitive myths of old man, grandfather, old woman's man and others into one. It's a myth that is now almost universally accepted, but one that is native to no one place. The detachment of the users of the RuneQuest site blinded them to many of the realities of the world. Arkat, the originator of hero questing, had a very basic rule. No questing without respect and humility. Rather than seeing unique living entities, the god learners just saw numbers, abilities and potential. The Godlayers rose to great power, completely dominating the Jurastelli lands. They boldly entered the Galanthan Godworld and reshaped it. They chopped, changed and moved gods at their whim. Portents of doom were ignored by them, their arrogance and power, hungriness coming first. In the world, catastrophes began happening due to their meddling. In one of the two lands involved in the Goddess Switch, all fruit-bearing plants stopped bearing fruit and the divorce rate between married couples went through the roof. Nature itself began revolting against the godlearners. Freak storms hit their fleets. Famine struck northern Pamaltella. Sea monsters and the shades of the drowned emerged in the Sea of the Dead, and the earth itself rebelled, destroying the civilizations of Slantos, Jurastella, and Seshnella, and the closing of the oceans was the killing blow to their empire that rapidly crumbled. As such, the godlearners are not spoken of favourably. Their legacy is feared and shunned. Their ruined cities are haunted and their magics thought evil. They are regarded as a mistake of history, miseries done by ancestors to embarrass the living. The closing is a major event that swept the oceans clear of all surface shipping and rendered all navigation impossible. It began in 920 when the first ships were swept away from Brithos. Nobody was truly sure what was going on as an invisible wall struck hundreds of merchant ships keeling them over or dragging them out to sea. It seemed to be spreading from Brithos at a rate of about 300 kilometres per year. Nobody seemed to be able to stop the closing and the rivers and ports were soon choked with wreckage. From 9.30 to 9.40, it swept Eurostella, destroying all watercraft from huge water cogs to small rafts. The whole incident was described by many as punishment for the god learners. The wave continued spreading across Garantha and ended in 9.70, by which time many empires had become isolated. The actual cause of the closing is still unknown. Next, we move on to the Third Age. The first disaster that struck Glorantha was the Syndic ban. Prince Snowdal, a son of the King of Loskalm, had journeyed onto the hero plane and killed the Ferelan God of Communications, the God of the Silver Feet. Dread rites were performed over the body which resulted in disaster. When they returned from the hero plane, they found that each separate state or region was cut off from their neighbours, taking the form of a pale grey haze or dense fog. Anyone who entered the fog would wander for weeks before finding themselves ultimately where they started. Temples were unable to communicate with one another. Indeed, trained birds could not fly over the ban. The ban ended in 1582 with what was known as the Thor. It moved eastward along the Janub. The lifting of the ban revealed new lands and peoples, most significantly the Kingdom of War. As of 1621, the ban has not completely lifted. Following this, we have the Lunar Empire. In Peloria, in 1220, a coven of divine researchers sought to reintegrate lost portions of magic from the God's Age. In the city of Torang, this was achieved with the birth of a woman initially called She Who Has Come. She later became known as the Red Goddess. She was first a young girl, then a powerful woman, then a terrifying demigod, then a loving goddess. She brought the philosophy of tolerance and freedom, bearing gifts of food, healing and transformation with open hands, while simultaneously dealing with threats to her people with closed hands. For eight years she walked a physical plane, then departed for a timeless hero quest, back to an age where even the gods cannot go. 
She was tested by gods and demons and returned after four years, saving her followers from extinction with the Crimson Bat. The Red Goddess turned to conquest and expansion for the next 13 years. The gods of Glorantha are really stirred to action due to the agreement of the Great Compromise. One thing which can free them to act is the invasion of chaos, and the fact that they were roused proves that the Red Goddess wrought with chaos. In 1247, the fabric of reality was torn at Castle Blue, and the Red Goddess emerged intact and woven into the reality of the world, gaining acceptance among the gods. She incarnates the death of gods and the emptiness before creation. During her ascension to the heavens, the very earth around her ascended into the sky, leaving a spot called the Crater, which no mortal may gaze upon lest they be driven mad. What she left behind was the political entity known as the Lunar Empire, commanded by the immortal Red Emperor. It's a theocratic centralised empire that is fond of innovation, which has earned its civilised citizens splendour, luxury and freedom. The Lunar Empire enjoyed many years of success expanding using a ritual in which the glow line is gradually extended over new territories, and yet not all were pleased with this expansion. Indeed, from 1375 to 1460, the barbarians of Pent, led by the famous lunar enemy Sheng Solaris, brought down the empire and plundered the moon, forcing the Red Emperor to go into hiding for 16 years, and yet, even he was ultimately conquered. Lunar expansion has continued with the Red Goddess sending her armies to convert or destroy followers of Orlanth. Orlanth has objected, and his prophets speak of the ominously named Invisible Wind, the Hidden Wind, and the Wind to Come. Although the exact nature of the closing is unknown, the end of it is surrounded in mystery also. Dormal claimed to have found a way of sidestepping it with a ritual from his cult. In 1580, Dormal the sailor first performed the ritual and set to sea. Within three years, the ritual had been taught to everyone in Western Genatella. Exploration has continued since. The Third Age is also nicely summarised in the point here. The last section deals with the hero wars and what they hold for those who take part. After this, we have a section on time in Glorantha. There are different ways of measuring time, based usually on region, religion and race. These are all detailed. After this, we have a section on the various languages of Glorantha set out by region and race, and finally some of Greg Stafford's designer notes where he discusses some of his reasoning and methods of the design of Glorantha. It offers some nice insight into his process. Okay, next up is book two, Genatella Book. It begins with discussing the time frame that the book is set in. It's currently 1621 ST, the ST standing for Since Time Began. It then goes on to further talk about the geographic and political divisions present across Genatella. It explains the format that the following 10 chapters will take, and it starts with the normal opening greeting that one would expect when meeting someone from that area, and then follows with the regional activity tables. These list dramatic and colourful events that are possible in a particular region. It then gives population figures broken down into cultural and species, and also talks about the maps. It then shows you a comparison of size between Genatella and North America, which should give you some idea of the kind of scale we are using, as well as a key to the kind of things you would expect on the maps contained within. It also gives an article in each chapter on a prophecy for the hero wars for that region, and how it could be interpreted. This adds a nice sense of colour and drama to proceedings. It also mentions that the maps will contain blank lands. These are regions of Granta that remain undeveloped by Chaosium, that have been put aside for you to create your own local campaign and your own vision. A nice touch. First up is Frenella. Home to the Kingdom of Lost Galm, Frenella is divided into six parts that range from the western coastal regions to the northern glacier, to the southern rugged hills and forests. A real mixed bag. The Kingdom of Lost Galm has a class system which means that every child, no matter their father's position, begins life as a farmer and must work their way up to positions of power, therefore giving nobody an advantage in life. Worship of the Invisible God is most widespread here along with the Hrestal sect. People of note here are Gaceron the Mystic, an ancient and powerful wizard who advised Prince Snowdal, and Gundrekin of Valsberg, the king of Loskalm, who was once a squire of Snowdal. It details the Genub River States, which involves such characters as Lord Death on a Horse, the ruler of the Kingdom of War, a cruel headhunter who enjoys eating raw meat. It gives detail of the Hero War prophecy, which involves a spirit called the Nameless Man, the Great Wolf, probably Telmor, and Arinsor, a chaos wizard who worshipped Kabaji. This is then followed by details of the Kingdom of the Jonatings, and has details on John Grow, the killer, the champion of Jonatella who has a voice that demoralises normal people, a battle roar that causes horses to flee, and a battle frenzy that makes knights weep in terror. It also details the barbarian clans, and then goes on to give a detailed history of Frenella, as well as give information of the great hero, Harak the Berserk. It gives us some maps of the region, and then lists a selection of places of interest. Of note here, a High Lama Pass, the only safe route over the Nidam Mountains, which has the citadel of Bad Deal, a place where dwarfs openly trade with humans, Sog City, a huge ancient decadent place ruled by the immortal Brithini, and the Kingdom of War, a place where a cruel people were discovered after the lifting of the ban. Next up is Kralorula. This is a region divided into four narrow north-south bands. It's a fertile land containing forests and light jungle. Just north of Kralorla is the Kingdom of Ignorance, or as it should more properly be known, the Bliss of Ignorance, a human land where the slavery of Trolkin is endemic. The region is mostly populated by humans, but also has Dragonutes and hostile merfolk. 
The humans are of the Crololo Dragon Empire and live in a highly structured society. They're ruled by the divine Dragon Emperor Godunya, who all adults worship as a state policy, and who rules the region through governors called Exarchs. Interestingly, despite their rigid social order, they work on the premise that a good farmer is more respected than a bad bureaucrat. They have a total belief that their society is the most perfect in the world. Godunya rules all with legendary benevolence. Priests and magicians practice dragon magic, although Western dragon youths consider this heresy. Of note here are Godunya the Dragon Emperor and Kui Hui the giant hero who is renowned for slaying a fierce lobster demon in the Swan Chao River. It then goes on to give us a detailed history of Krolorola, which claims that it was uninterrupted by the darkness. Their history of Dragon King's succession was stalled by the God Learners, although they were eventually overthrown. The Hero Wars prophecy that surrounds Krolorola involves the God Learners and the Sun Stop. Places of interest in Krolorla are the Bliss of Ignorance, a bitter and wasted land that contains the ruins of inhuman civilizations, Chi Ting, the permanent residence of the Emperor, and the magic bridges of Gudunya that are being designed to link up the land while simultaneously keeping the teeming masses of poor busy. It gives a little information on dragons in Krolorla and also the Hassan Chin there. Following this is the Lunar Empire. Feared and hated by outsiders, it is one of the finest places to live in all of Grantha. Peace reigns here and it has a stable government and a contented society. The population is mostly human, although the trolls of the Blue Moon Plateau reside here. A colony of brews is also said to exist here. Guided by the Red Goddess, the people are moulded by the freedom she offers. The Empire depends on the Red Emperor, an incarnation of the Red Goddess, and his entourage for leadership and unity. He has been reborn several times, and in his current incarnation is active in his experimentation with magic and involvement in heroic affairs. The Hero Wars prophecy here involves the transformation of the Red Moon into the White Moon when her acceptance is spread all over the world. The Empire is divided into several parts which include the once powerful Kingdom of Carmania, the Lunar Heartlands, Provinces and the Lunar Allies. The Lunar Religion is one of tolerance and all-embracing unity and local religions and cults are tolerated and even supported if they are beneficial. The Lunar Empire began around 400 years ago with the rebirth of the Red Goddess. Its history is one peppered with war and conquest, with the war with Sheng Celeris and the overthrow of almost all Orlanthi resistance being major events. It gives information on Carmania, along with some of the prominent figures of the region. Initially, the Carmanians stubbornly resisted the advances of the Red Goddess, but were ultimately crushed in 1232 when the Red Goddess brought the Crimson Bat into the world. The region was conquered in the Blood King Wars. Of note in Carmania are Burnt Wall, the once capital of the kingdom that remains as burned stone stripped of all mortar and blackened by magical fire, and Oranin Lake, the site of the climatic battle by the Red Goddess at Castle Blue. After this we have the Lunar Heartland, a vast expanse of grassland mostly turned into farming regions. Two cultures reside here, that of the Darahappans and the Pelorians. The Darahappan culture claims to be descended from the pre-God War culture established by Yelm during Universal Peace and is extremely patriarchal, urban and rigid. They worship the solar religion of Yelm and his sons and they consider other religions a barren cult or misguided souls. Their nobility are descended from Yelm himself and they consider the Pelorians nothing more than peasants. The Pelorians are descended from many bloodlines, and although considered lowly, they are the backbone of the Empire. They tend to live a simple existence where bread and beer are the good things in life. The cities tend to be big villages. Of worthy mention here is Jaril the Razoress. Rumoured to be the current incarnation of the Red Goddess, she is a powerful hero quester who has been involved in numerous historical events since her birth in 1588. Places of interest in the Lunar Heartland are Crater, the place where the Red God has ascended to take her place in the heavens, Glamour, the imperial capital where the Red Emperor resides, Torang, the birthplace of the Red Goddess, which contains the room where the Seven Mothers perform their legendary ritual, and Rist, the place where the Elf Forest was destroyed by the Moonbird in 1296. This is followed with information on the Lunar Provinces, which are south of Peloria, that nears Dragon Pass and the Rockwood Mountains. The culture here is generally Orlanthi in nature, and they practice the old ways. The Lunars have attempted to substitute the Lunar Goddess Malani for Orlanth, which has resulted in the Barbarians dropping Storm the Worship altogether in favour of an Elder. Of interest here is Ivex Devouring God, an Imperial tax collector claimed to be an omnipotent demon. Lunar encroachment began in the region around 1300, with Huaran Dalthippa, the conquering daughter, imposing herself upon the tribes, uniting them. Places of interest here are Boldholm, the capital of Sartar, and residence of the Prince of Sartar. City of 10,000 Magicians, named because it would last until 10,000 magicians had entered its gates and is no longer open to outsiders. Dorostor, which has its own book dedicated to it that I've previously reviewed, and Sartar, the most recent conquest of the Lunar Empire. Next, it details the Lunar Allies. This gives information on the various peoples who are not under direct control of the Red Emperor, but who are close allies. It includes the Blue Moon Trolls, the Karnon Nomads, and the Thrice Blessed People. Each of the regions has accepted the Lunar Way as a way that surrounds their own core beliefs. Of interest here is Binna Bang, a powerful dark troll from the Blue Moon Plateau whose lover is a god and son is a demon. 
Places of interest here include the Blue Moon Plateau itself, where the native trolls reside, Erigia, the region destroyed by the Skyburn, a massive spell engineered by the Charon tribe, who breed winged and carnivorous horses there, and the Sea of Ice, also known as the White Sea, a vast freezing sea that has been known to freeze over entirely during particularly harsh winters. The next region discussed is Mineria. It has three main components, Dragon Pass to the north, Cathayla, the holy country at the centre, and Monelia to the west. The troll land of Dagori and Karth is at the northeastern border. Due to its importance on Glorantha, Dragon Pass has given its own section in this book. The land is mostly populated by humans, although there are populations of Aldrei army, trolls and dragon newts. It has a general tribal culture and the Orlanthi pantheons are mostly worshipped, although the Lunar Empire is working on supplanting this. People of note here are Brian, King of the Volsaxi, the last independent Orlanthi King of Hjortland, and Leonardo the Scientist, a mad genius whose crazy inventions are as useful as they are unique. This land was formerly called the Archduchy of Slontos and was part of the Jurastelli Empire. The closing threw the land into disarray as disasters both natural and unnatural struck. In 1050, the goddess Slontos rolled over and sunk the land beneath the waves, leaving only mountaintops. Arkat the Liberator conquered Cathayla and left the region under troll rule under the control of a troll known as Only Old One, who remained in power for over 800 years. In 1313, Belinta the Stranger appeared, his origins unknown. He began a five-year campaign that concluded in the deposition of the Only Old One and became known as the Pharaoh. In 1336, the pharaoh had used up his body, using the tournament of the masters of luck and death to find another body to inhabit, with the winner's soul being liberated with consciousness and an angelic existence. In 1580, Dormal the sailor arrived at Cathayla to perform the opening of the seas, lifting the 650-year-old curse. In 1616, the pharaoh vanished after failing to find another body to inhabit, and in 1619, the lunar army conquered the Volsaxi land, apart from the citadel of Whitewall. It then gives us a nice chronology of the Lunar Empire's conquests in Mineria, and this is followed by places of interest. Included here are Casino Town, a well-fortified enclave that worships the patron spirit Our Lady of Credit, the City of Lead, wherein you can find Kai Galito herself if you go deep enough, God Forgot, a tidal-washed archipelago that has a prehistoric atheist colony, Hjortland, a pleasant farming region inhabited by Orlanthi barbarians, Machine Ruins, a twisted terrible city that was part of the downfall of the Godlearners, and a now largely abandoned City of Wonders that was formerly the residence of the Pharaoh. Next up is perhaps the most important place in all Garantha, Dragon Pass. It's worth pointing out here that for some reason the writer saw fit to place large black banners down the side of the page to indicate its presence in the book. Perhaps putting it in the first chapter would have been a better aesthetic fit for the book. Dragon Pass is extremely strategic in Garantha, sitting at the crossroads of the continent of Genatella. It's a very magical region and the centre of the world for many world myths. Many scholars and prophets predict that Dragon Pass will be the fuse that lights the powder keg of the Hero Wars. The people of note in Dragon Pass is like a who's who of powerful Grantham personalities. It features Crag Spider, a dark troll that is considered to be the most powerful of her kind, who is the creator of the first great trolls and a demigod. Delecti the Necromancer, a powerful lord of the Empire of the Worm Friends who broke the barrier between life and death and became immortal. The Inhuman King, who is the ruler of the Dragon Newts. Einhoof, Lord of the Beast Valley, a demigod centaur ruler of the Beastmen, and Kelia Starbrow, the famous Sartar hero quester. As you would expect, a lot of the hero war prophecies are abound in Dragon Pass and range from the Mostali reconstruction of the world machine to the rise of the Inhuman King. Places of interest in Dragon Pass are Beast Valley, the home of the Beastmen, Dragon's Eye, one of the largest dragon cities in Glorantha, Dragon Pass with the famous passage between the two ranges of hills near Wintertop, the Kingdom of Sartar, Skyfall Lake, the Kingdom of Tarsh, and the legendary Snake Pipe Hollow. Please send my other reviews for a full breakdown of this truly magnificent chaos-infested hellhole. Next up is Pent. A wide grassland broken by a few rises and wild rivers, it is a place where no civilizations have existed since time began. It's a place frozen by arctic storms that blow in from Valen's wastes and is populated by human nomads. They follow the traditional tribal structure of blood kinship, where society is divided into gender and then into age and job strata. Religious worship here among solar tribes is often Yelm, Golden Bow, Hippoi, tribal ancestors and various spirits, and among storm tribes, Orlanth, Humak, Stormbull and Gagarth are worshipped as winds. Of interest in Pent is the Hellcrack, a great gap in the land that leads directly to the centre of the earth and Red Hair Place, a spot where Pent tribes must send their red-headed children to be hostages of the Lunar Empire. Following this is Ralios, a great expanse centred upon Felster Lake. The most prominent region is Sefelster, which is made up of many prominent cities, city-states, baronies and dukedoms. Of note here is the religion of Ralios. Other than the worship of the Invisible God, Arkat is worshipped in seven cults. That of Great Arkat, the founder of the kingdom, Arkat Liberator, the knight who liberated the region from an army of monsters, Arkat the Saviour, the destroyer of Gabaji who oppressed Ralios and Tanasaur, Arkat Chaosbane, the destroyer of Chaos, where they say that he was responsible for destroying Wakboth and Krajalk in God time, 
Arkat Peacemaker, the bringer of peace here. Arkat Destroyer, the incarnation of destruction, who's believed to be returning to the world at some point. And even Arkat the Deceiver, a cult centred around the belief that Arkat was in fact Gabaji and Nysalor, either before or after their climactic battle in Dorostor. There is a drive in Ralios to unite the various city-states, with the stumbling block being that nobody is able to agree on the central authority. People of note in the region are Grundia, the hero of the Seven Storms, who has mastered the art of hurling javelins, then leaping upon them and steering them with his feet, and Argin Terra, sometimes called the Nightmare Sorcerer, and the Son of the Devil, the most feared magician in Ralios. Also listed are some of the underground organisations of Ralios, which are abound due to the petty intrigue of the region. Places of interest in the region include the aforementioned Bad Deal, Boron, the place of origin of the Borist heresy of Malkianism, Hurla Amali, an ancient ruin that glows at night and is shadowy at day due to ancient mystical energies that still permeate the place, Wonderwood, a place world renowned for its incredible beasts, and Zarak Arkat, a temple for protected by its namesake, a powerful spirit said to be the manifestation of Arkat the Troll. Next up is Seshnella. This kingdom has two parts. To the east, the kingdom of Seshnella, and to the west, Old Seshnella. It's a feudal, conservative culture, populated mostly by humans. It was the centre of life throughout the darkness, and was known for embracing the god-learners and paying the price. In 1049, a shipload of the demigod Nuatha people destroyed Old Seshnella by casting a terrible magic that made the land roll and cities fall. A mountain-wide tidal wave turned the southern land into islands, and a wave of blue and red light washed across the land, killing thousands, while an elf army slaughtered all livestock and escorted the humans to the border. Of interest here is the ruin of Arkhome, a fortress established by Arkat the Liberator, the Palace of the Pentacle, where the chief wizards who oversee all magic in Aralanit reside, and Red Ruin, the former capital thrown down by Arkat the Liberator that was once ruled by the vampire king of Tanisor. We also have some notes on the nature of the immortal Brathini, which make for an interesting read and more seeds for the hero wars. Next up is Teshnos. A small region of forest and savannah, Teshnos is a culture dominated by fire worship. The king of the land has his every move dictated by the council of high priests to worship the sky gods. It has a theocratic government and the population is of crawly human stock and yellow elves. The religious pantheon is fairly similar to the solar one and the land has a history of occupation and abuse by overlords. Also contained within Teshnos is a nation of Amazon women. Any man who visits here must be killed, enslaved or receive the visitor's collar which protects and demeans them at the same time. Places of interest here are Glass Forest, where everything, trees, plant animals, is transparent, and Trojang, the jungle-covered nation of Amazons. Last but not least is the Wastelands. Hostile to outsiders, the area is difficult to explore. The land is harsh and inconsistent. A vast whirlwind rages at its centre. This is the home of Stormbull. Great ruins of forgotten civilizations pepper the land, and it's where the five great Praxian animal nomad tribes live. The Sable Riders, High Armor Riders, Impala Riders, Bison Riders, and the Moracanth. Among the people of note in the region are Argrath, the hero-questing warrior of Sartar, and Agaji, chewer of flesh, the most influential woman of the Paps. During the god time, this region was the capital of Geneth, the land god, and it was fertile and glorious. That is, until it was ruined by Wakboth the devil. It was the place where the block fell from the heavens, pinning the devil beneath it, and where Waha the butcher came and dug the good canal. Prax has perhaps some of the most important locations in Glaranthan history, such as the Big Rubble, the ruins of the city of Pavis, the aforementioned block, Krijalki Bog, above which Stormbull lives, Paps, the enormous earth temple complex with a thousand priests, the plateau of statues, a relic of god time said to contain the ruins of dead gods, Prax itself, and the river of cradles. Following this, we have an index of the book. Finally, we have Player's Book, Genatella, the final part of the set. This has the inscription, May Waha bless this book and all the tribes described within. A nice touch. The book describes four different character types for the Glorantha setting with four different cultures. The primitive Asuncian, the nomadic Praxian, the barbarian Orlanthi and a medieval Western. These are not limits set in the context of the world but suggestions. It gives information on role-playing Glorantha characters and discusses the box narratives. It gives the coming-of-age memories of someone from each of the cultures as told by various important people in the character's life. In the instances here, they are fathers and uncles. The first up are the Asuncian. It discusses their primitive way of life and how the clans work, and has important information on gender relations. In the case of the Hussuncian, women are afforded a higher social status than men. It discusses their living conditions and how the rules of law are dealt with, and then goes on to discuss Hussuncian religion. Their religion is centred around the Great Spirit and Grandmother Earth, and they worship various other Great Spirits. Next up is the Praxian nomadic culture. As with the Hussuncian, it discusses their way of life, which is, in the case of the Praxians, nomadic. Their society has a general equal gender balance, with polygamy and polandry being acceptable. On a religious level, they pay respect to Stormbull and worship Waha and Erythia. Following this, we have the Orlanthi culture. Orlanthi society is generally on an extended patriarchal level, with clan leaders and bloodlines being very important. 
They're generally distrust, but are respectful to outsiders, and have social equality between the sexes. They usually follow the Lightbringer pantheon, with all Anthenalda, Lankormai, Asaris and Humact being the most popular. They have a particular distaste for the Lunar pantheon due to their suppression of the worship of Orlan. Next up is the Western culture. This is spread across four major regions, Seshnella, Loskelm, Sefelsta and Carmania. The culture is a feudal one with class tiers existing similar to that in medieval Europe. Their society is patriarchal and they generally follow the invisible god, believing in the heaven of Solus due to the revelations of Malchion and consider followers of other gods to be pagans. Following this we have pages of tables of geographic regions to be used for rolling characters up. Genetella, Crucible of the Hero Wars, is a work of historical wonder beset with most of the issues that all RuneQuest material of this time had. The artwork throughout, while not being as bad as the likes of Troll Gods, is fairly naff and way too big. There are large passages where, frankly, you are bludgeoned with information that overloads your brain. Indeed, it took me five weeks to take in this set and understand it for this review. That is not to, in any way, denigrate what is here. It's written by Greg Stafford and Sandy Peterson, and it shows. Things like Richard the Tiger-Hearted and Leonardo the Scientist aside, it's just magnificent. The material here is an absolute thoroughbred in a role-playing market full of the usual fantasy tropes. The historical events described within had far-reaching effects across all of Garantha, and the way it all ties together is nothing short of genius. RuneQuest's greatest strength, for me, has always been its mythology. It's not quite like anything else in the most wonderful way, but the way Stafford and Peterson have made it permeated into the lives of the normal living people and creatures of Garantha is really something to behold. The writers make you understand the likes of Arkat's crusade, then pull the carpet from under your feet by planting the seeds of doubt that may be always not as it seemed. That is RuneQuest for me. Nothing's ever straightforward, and that's what makes me love it as much as I do. It's my sincere hope that the material contained here is fine-tuned and injected into the new edition of RuneQuest, because to do so would further establish RuneQuest's legacy as the daddy of them all. I give Genetella, Crucible of the Hero Wars, 9 out of 10. If you enjoyed this review, please hit the thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Also, don't forget to check out my other reviews. But out.